the snow slowly falls, carpeting the hills with a blanket of white. Deepest winter has always been the hardest time of year to survive. The days are short, life is withdrawn, and the raw power of the earth rules the land. The sight of any creature during winter is always a surprise, and this short-eared owl will surely be hungry to be out amongst the snowfall, especially when one would expect his quarry to be hibernating in the dense, frostbitten heather and bilberry. Walking in the landscape during January, most people would not expect to see a single wildflower, but surprisingly, some of our most magical plants add splashes of colour to secret places throughout deepest winter. Let us begin our journey in the southern peaks, where the half smoke from the houses of Matlock Bath rises like a mist above the Wye Gorge. Sir Richard Arkwright, and later his son Peter Arkwright, created a series of paths through the woods above the gorge, an obvious escape from the heavy industry downstream. Near the summit of High Tor, we encounter the striking red fruits of Black Bryony. Black Bryony is a creeping woodland plant whose weak stems tangle and twine around any trees and bushes they encounter. The tiny flowers appear in May, but in winter, all its petals and heart-shaped leaves have disappeared. Its stems are stripped back and the blood-red berries appear. Birds love them, but beware, for they are highly poisonous to us, acting as an emetic. The root of the plant has, however, been used successfully in the past. The express juice mixed with honey was used as a remedy for asthmatic complaints, and the pulp root was used as a stimulating plaster in gout and rheumatism. From the summit of High Tor, a narrow path leads along the cliff of Giddy Edge. The southern end is dense with vegetation, and here we see our first winter flower, the spurred laurel. This striking shrub, usually no more than a metre high, is covered in dark, shiny, oval green leaves, each clustered around the top of a stem. Between the leaves fall lobed bright yellow flowers beckoning the early insects. The common name, spurge laurel, is something of a misnomer, and the plant is neither a spurge nor a laurel, but belongs to the Daphne family. As with black bryony, this too is a dangerous plant. The sap can cause irritating rashes, and if it enters the eyes, blindness. Further down the Wye, the village of Cromford is encountered, where Sir Richard Arkwright built the first water-powered cotton mill in 1771. Above the World Heritage Site, on a deeply scarred limestone knoll, is a very strange plant, the stinking hellebore. There is still some argument as to whether this is a native to Britain, or was introduced from its homes in the mountains of southern Europe. It is now most commonly known for its striking garden varieties, which burst forth to let us know that winter is finally breaking. The stinking hellebore is steeped in folklore. It is associated with witchcraft and was used in a variety of spells, from demon conjuring to flying ointment. In Christian lore, the first stinging hellebore is said to have sprouted from the tear of a young girl who visited Jesus in Bethlehem, and its historical associations go back even further. During the siege of Kira in 585 BC, the Greek forces poisoned the town's water supply by adding crushed hellebore leaves into it. Within a day, the entire town was stricken with severe diarrhoea, and the Greeks took control easily, though I wouldn't have liked to have been involved in the clean-up operation. More insidious was their use in the death of Alexander the Great. He was in Babylon when, under a conspiracy by top Greek politicians, he was poisoned by his most trusted cup-bearer. But not all tales revolving around the stinking hellebore are dark, for the daughters of King Midas were touched with madness by Dionysus, and found running through the streets naked and screaming. The quick actions of Melampus of Pylos administered a special potion made from hellebore and restored their sanity. The 
Hidden among the heart's tongue ferns and tangled branches of the old rock garden at Island Hall are the most famous winter blooms. With over 30 English vernacular names, including dewdrops, candlemas bells and February fair maidens, the delicate snowdrops thrive in the cold and bring cheer to all who set eyes upon them. According to Christian legend, an angel created the first snowdrops, turning falling snowflakes into fragile flowers to give Adam and Eve a sign of hope after their eviction from the Garden of Eden. Today they continue to bring hope and the alkaloid galantamine, which is extracted from snowdrops, is being used to treat Alzheimer's disease. Snowdrops spread slowly and in the garden don't like to be growing on their own. In some parts of the Peak District, where they have been naturalised for many centuries, they form carpets of snow gently swaying in the chill winds. To the untrained eye, snowdrops may all look the same, but in fact there are several hundred varieties. This is Galanthus nivalis flora pleno. Inside is a whole set of petals curled up like the layers of an intricate dress. Galanthus nivalis sandesi is one of our rarest varieties. Bright yellow in colour, it never grows in profusion even in its strongholds. Local legend claims that these were introduced way back in the 8th century by Viking invaders. Lone flower, hemmed in with snows and white as they, but hardier far, once more I see thee bend thy forehand, as if fearful to offend like an unbidden guest, though day by day storms, sallying from the mountain tops, waylay the rising sun, and on the plains descend, chaste snowdrop, venturous harbinger of spring, and pensive monitor of fleeting years. Throughout the Peak District, there are many roadside nature reserves, harbouring rare plants clinging on for survival at the edgelands of our urban boundaries. Near the town of Darleydale, this verge holds a colony of the winter heliotrope. Introduced from North Africa, it is now spread throughout Europe, but is still uncommon in the peaks. Here, the large patches of kidney-shaped leaves give birth to spurs containing the floret of vanilla-scented blooms. The name heliotrope is derived from the Greek helios meaning sun and tropos meaning turn, a reference to the flowers tracking the low sun across the sky on a winter's day. Surprisingly, they are relatively intolerant of frost and a severe one can kill them, meaning many of the strongest colonies survive in sheltered locations. Winter heliotrope is a relative of the widespread butterbur, but unlike butterbur, is an evergreen and its leaves are visible all year round. The River Wye starts its journey on the hills above Buxton before winding its way down through the spectacular gorge of Millersdale. Here the valley is dominated by its industrial history, with towering viaducts, colossal quarries and crumbling kilns. Standing in their shadow is the diminutive Miserion, the second British member of the Daphne family. The name Daphne comes from an ancient Greek legend. Daphne was a water nymph who appealed to Aphrodite to save her from the lustful god Apollo. As a result, she was turned into a tree, and from that day on, Grecian virgins wore Miserian leaves as a sign of their purity. An alpine species, it grows mainly in scrubby limestone woodlands with loose screes. It can vanish as quickly as it appears, for the plant contains heat shock proteins, and if it gets too cold, a reaction is triggered whereby all energy that year is put into flowering and the plant then dies. Here, the bright pink flowers unfurl on an old incline, where the surrounding trees are sparse enough for them to survive. The sap from the Miserion is as toxic as the spurred laurels. In the past, ladies who could not afford the more expensive rouge used to spread it on their cheeks to trigger redness. In fact, this was a sign of the blood vessels being destroyed, a heavy price to pay for beauty. The red berries which appear on the plant later in the year are also deadly. In the 18th century, they were used against alcohol abuse, 
Being a violent purgative, if a drunkard was given a berry to eat, a sudden reaction would have meant he wouldn't be drinking for some time to come. Elsewhere, as in this sunny spot in Cresbrook Dale, the plant grows to a much grander size, with dozens of florets bursting forth from the fractured screes. An incredible sight. An almost mythical plant in Britain is the Yellow Star of Bethlehem. It rarely flowers, our climate being too cold for its magnificent star-like flowers. But in a few special spots, colonies can appear with hundreds of blooms. This small knoll above Snitterton is home to such a colony. The bare, moist soil below the beach stand is perfect for its reproduction. The vibrant yellow flowers only open with the sun and in a dazzling display reflect its light. When you can't see the flowers, you can still identify the plant by its coiled and pointed leaf ends. Along with woodlands, it can also be found on the silty banks of streams and in the thin soil on limestone crags. I have spent many years surveying the plant in the Peak District and there is no other colony as beautiful as this. The radiant yellow flowers in the first week of March are a sure sign that the dark days of winter are coming to an end and spring is on the way. And in the deep woods of Lathkildale, another plant is just beginning its growth. Pushing its way out of the shady leaf litter, these tiny green hellebores will grow into one of our most spectacular woodland plants. And much, much more is awakening throughout the land. When daisies pied and violets blue, and lady smocks all silver white, and cuckoo buds of yellow hue do paint the meadows with delight, when shepherds pipe on oaten straws, and merry larks are ploughmen's clocks. <laughs>